for every hour that you're actually flying, it's about two hours on the ground preparing and, you know, finishing up the flight. The Job Guppy podcast is on a mission to help career explorers and job seekers find out from real people what a specific career or job is really like on a day-to-day basis. Join me, your host, Chris Hodges, as we dive in and explore jobs with each guest. You'll hear from experienced working professionals with transparent, realistic, and job-specific insight about their daily roles and their career journey. We go on to explore other topics like job search recommendations and income and salaries. You'll hear answers to questions like, do I need to go to college for this job? How much college? What is your work-life balance like? What do you like or dislike? Or what would you do different? And if you don't like what you hear about one job role, we discuss alternative job titles to explore related to the same industry. And my favorite part is the end where the guest shares their inspirational insight and recommendations for the next person wanting to get started on their career journey. In this episode, we discuss the role of a pilot in the private aviation industry. Brian Miller is one of our guests. He is not just a captain, but he is also a training captain for a private aviation company. He has accumulated over 13,000 hours of flight time in single-engine prop aircraft to the latest twin-engine jet with the most advanced avionics. He has a commercial pilot certificate, ATP certificate, and multiple type ratings on different aircrafts. He holds a bachelor's degree from Northern Kentucky University. We also have James Kiersing as one of our guests. James is a 17-year-old aspiring pilot. He has wanted to be a pilot for as long as he can remember and is already pursuing his pilot's license with the local Civil Air Patrol cadet program. During the interview, Brian outlines his daily routines and what it means to be a fractional airline pilot. The fractional airline industry is where multiple people share the cost of ownership and operation of an aircraft or maybe a fleet of aircraft. I will include links to several fractional airline companies in the show notes for reference purposes. Before this interview, neither James nor I had ever heard of the fractional airline industry. Brian shares how his career progressed from flying during his college years all the way to where he is now as a training captain. He and James discuss the pros and cons of attending an aviation-related college versus a specialized flight school. We discuss how longevity and seniority with a company play a big role in pay, vacation, and better schedule options, and how even a very experienced pilot may have to start over if they change companies late in their career. Towards the end, Brian goes over the perks he, his family, and even his friends benefit from in his role. I personally thought his comment about not paying for hotels for probably the last 10 years, in addition to all the free airline travel, was pretty impressive. I've been flying commercially, I guess, for... Oh, it's coming up on 27 years now. I, I have flown in the airlines for quite a while. I flew, flew at a couple of different airlines, and I have found myself for the last 17 years flying at a fractional airline, if you will. And basically what that is, is the best way to explain it, is it's a timeshare for wealthy individuals and companies to buy into the airplane or aircraft and um, be able to have that aircraft at their disposal to fly just about anywhere they want to in the world. So I was a first officer for quite a while, and I'm a captain now, and I'm also a training captain. So basically what that is is that when new captains and new first officers come into our fleet, I train them and kind of get them on their way and get them flying out on what we call the line for the fractional airline that I work with. Of course, we'll circle back into that and kind of dig into those details and uh, what all those mean. But James, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm James, as you mentioned. I am 16 years old, about to be 17 in about two weeks. I've been interested in aviation my entire life. Originally wanted to go to the Air Force Academy, decided, eh, not for me. And so now I'm interested in commercial aviation. Great. I appreciate that. So, okay, Brian, jumping into it then, let's just talk a little bit about, you know, break this down. And I mentioned before we started recording, you know, some of the things I look for on these interviews is, you know, there's a stereotypical what you get when you Google, I want to be a pilot. You know, the FAA has a blurb about it. Couldn't find a lot. There's a few, I think the best one I found was uh, the Piper, Piper Piper.com had how to become a pilot, learn if aviation is the right career for you. But 
if you could maybe just talk about being a pilot, if you could break that down, it could be what you do right now and maybe a little bit about what it was as a commercial. Yeah, I guess what's the things that people don't see? Because when I go to the airport, the pilot comes in with his suitcase walking behind him and the flight crew and you walk on the plane and you go sit in the captain's seat and you you know smile and wave and make some announcements, welcome everybody aboard. But is there more to that than being a, a pilot, let you take it from here and kind of break it down and share with people what it's like on a really a daily basis? Okay. So... Yeah, I, so for being uh, in the fractional world now, it, it is pretty different from being at the airlines. I like to say that for every hour that you're actually flying, it's about two hours on the ground preparing and, you know, finishing up the flight. Um, a typical day usually starts, we, we have iPhones and all the communications between myself and the company is through the iPhone, through an app. and they usually give me what's called a briefing the night prior and it has my schedule for the next day. Typically it's about four, yeah, three or four flights a day. Um, and they can range anywhere from 30 minutes all the way up to I've had six and a half hour flights. So an average day, I usually wake up about six o'clock in the morning, get down to the van that takes me over to the airport and because we are a fractional, we are usually on what what I like to call the opposite side of the uh, airport, the private side. So we're at the FBOs where you would do flight training and where all the private airplanes come in. At that point, we usually check in for our flight via the iPhone and gather up all of our weather reports, all of our schedules, and then who we're flying for that day. And once we get all the paperwork kind of in our hands, we make our way out to the uh, airplane and do a pre-flight. And usually, since it's both myself and my first officer, we each have separate separate jobs. So the the captain he usually walks around the airplane, does the pre-flight, makes sure that you know we have fuel on board, makes sure that there's oils in the engines. You're doing this. I mean, this is you and your officer with you. This is not a mechanic yes. that's doing this for you. Oh, no. Yeah, this okay. is myself and my first officer. Yeah. So typically, we'll, we'll walk around the airplane, make sure that, you know, nothing's leaking from it. And everything looks like it's in good shape that it can, in fact, go fly. So once we do the walk around, once we get in, typically while I'm on the outside of the airplane, the first officer is on the inside of the airplane, making sure that, you know, it's clean, that we have the proper catering on board and making sure that everything just looks appropriate inside the cabin. Once we do that, we start up the uh, airplane with the APU, which is the auxiliary power unit, and start working through all the systems of the airplane, making sure that all the systems, all the computers are correct and reacting correctly. And from that point, we start programming the flight, which basically puts in our route from say point A to point B. And we verify that with each other and, and everything within the, uh, the airline business, if you will, is always at least cross-checked with someone else. So if I'm looking at the weather, for instance, I have people back in the uh, headquarters that are meteorologists and dispatchers, and they've looked at the weather as well. When I put in a flight plan, my first officer looks at the flight plan. We verify that against what air traffic control has given us. So it's a lot of double checking, even triple checking in certain stance. Once all of the programming is taken care of, once you know all the checks of the aircraft are done, we kind of sit there, wait, and uh, wait for our owners to show up, which is a little bit different than the airlines since they own the aircraft they pretty much show up you know typically on time sometimes they're late sometimes they're early but it, it's their airplane and they get to do pretty much what they want to do so once they're on or show up we make sure that they are in fact who they are usually checking some type of license some type of passport and then loading the luggage once we get them on inside the aircraft 
it's up to either myself or my first officer to give them a brief, which is basically the flight attendant brief that you hear on the commercial airlines. Once that's all done, we get up front, give ourselves one more briefing, and then start the flight. Is all that work regardless of whether you have a 30-minute flight or a six-hour flight? Hey, exactly. Yeah. And, okay. and it could be as much as a five-minute flight on some flights that we may have with with empty legs with, with no passengers. So, yes. You can die and crash just as easily in five minutes as you can <laughs> in an hour, right? <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> it. Absolutely. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, yeah, you, you do the flight and if it's a uh, smooth flight where there's no weather or no traffic, as far as air traffic, that's delaying you, it should be a, a normal flight at the end of it. We offload the passengers, offload their luggage, clean the airplane and do it all over again. I was surprised to hear you say you do that sometimes. I think you said like three or four times a day is that's oh, happened. Oh before? yeah. So tip, a, a typical day is you'll usually start out with what we like to call an empty leg with no passengers. And we fly to the destination where, where the passengers actually are, pick up passengers, take them to a destination, and then we'll fly to another location to find other passengers to fly them to where they need to go. And I typically, see. it's about a four four leg day. And like I said, so some of the um, empty legs where there's no passengers, it, it could be as I, I've had as short of legs as six minutes. And like I said, the my longest flight has been yeah about six and a half, six hours and forty five minutes or so. You're not doing the whole pre check three or four times a day and like leaving from the same spot. You've done a pre check, you get going, and then you're kind of going leg to leg at that point. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And once once you do a, a lot of the the pre flight, if you will, that we're allowed to omit certain things um, in subsequent legs. So yeah. uh, it it does shorten it up, but still, uh, like I said, it, it's for about every hour that you're flying. You 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 know, for at least one hour on the uh, in the air, it's about two hours on the ground, eh, give or take. You know, so yeah. it, it's. It's uh, quite the process, really, on the ground. Yeah, I'm surprised to hear it's that flip sided. I would have kind of thought the opposite, maybe. But James, you've probably had some insight into this already, and some of the, you know the things you've been involved in. Has that been your experience so far? Yeah, I would say doing the orientation flights with Civil Air Patrol, you go through all the pre checks and stuff, and there are certain things that that have uh, omitted because they did that before you get to the plane in general. But yeah, I'd say I think on an hour long O flight, there's probably about an hour and a half of just pre-checking, and that's just for a Cessna 152. So yeah. there's the little things I pick up myself on each of these interviews. <laughs> so it's a good, very good breakdown. You know, a lot of the things I have that I try to cover is like in the office, out of the office, you know, travel meetings, stuff like that. You know, it, it doesn't sound like you go into an office hardly at all. It's a lot of communication remotely, so to speak, where you're getting things over the phone iPhone or something, and then you're basically going on into the airport. You know, you're not having to go into some debriefing room for two hours before you get to walk out to right. the plane. So exactly. So in your case, you call this a fractional airline? Is that what you called it? Yeah, yeah. That's a, a term that's airline. recognized in the industry. Fractional airline. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So typically, there, there's um, you know, you have the airlines that everybody is familiar with, American, Delta, United, and all that. And then you have the charter business, which is basically individuals and individual companies that rent out their airplanes on a, a single use, if you will. And then the, the company I work for is the fractional. And there's, oh, there's a handful of them, but primarily there's three well-known fractional uh, outfits out there. The individuals actually own part of that aircraft. You know, if you could maybe touch a little bit on, you know, your career path, how you got there, what were the different levels and titles you went through? I guess the unique part too, you know, is there anything unique about your role other than maybe other fractional airline pilots? Uh, you know, anything that sets you apart from them that you think would be neat to, you know, talk about? Yeah, I, I'm kind of like James. I Since I was little, I knew I wanted to fly airplanes. My father was a commercial pilot. I remember going on trips with him as you know, a, a middle schooler. And I thought, oh, 
I think I could do this. This looks pretty cool. So as I graduated high school, I started getting into the training aspect of it. For me personally, I had thought about the military just for a short while, decided that wasn't really for me. And I decided that if anything ever happened to me physically or I couldn't fly an airplane, I wanted something to fall back on. So I went into college for a communications degree. So my background in college is communications. And as I was getting that degree, I flew on the side. So I went to just a private um, uh, airport in Cincinnati and uh, flew on the side, found a flight instructor and started flying, started flying privately. The normal sequence is you go and get your private license, which usually takes about 35 to 40 hours of flight time. From there, typically, and, and I say this typically, it, it, there are many different paths, but this is, you know, if you take this path, this is kind of the typical path. I went and got my instrument license, which basically, when you get your private, you're flying line of sight. So whatever you see out the window, that's where you're flying to. When you get into your instrument rating, you go into the instrument panel right in front of you. So you can fly strictly off of the panel and not look outside and get from point A to point B. Once you get that license, you typically go on to get your commercial license, which I believe is, James probably knows better than me at this point, but uh, usually it's about 250 hours, I believe. It's still at where you get your commercial license. And during each one of these sequences through private instrument and commercial, you have to take a written test. You have to have a oral test in front of a flight examiner. And then a practical test. You have to go up in an airplane and actually show them that you know how to fly and, and do the certain sequences that they want you to fly. So I got my commercial license. And from there, you're basically just building time. That's what I did along with getting my CFI, which is a certified flight instructor. So I was a certified flight instructor, a certified flight instructor instrument rated. At one time, I was able to teach any new student their private license, their commercial, and uh, eventually instrument, commercial, and uh, multi-engine. So that was kind of my path to get the hours that I needed to eventually get paid to fly an airplane. After I flight instructed for about a year somewhere in that neighborhood i went and got a freight job which i was basically flying packages for ups uh, fedex and just the united uh, states postal service just all their postal service um in a small twin engine uh prop airplane i did that until i got about 1200 to 1500 hours and i ended up getting hired to american eagle which was a regional airline at the time i flew there for a while as a first officer i upgraded to captain that was during i'm showing my age now um 911 911 <laughs> happened and that kind of had a paradigm shift with how i thought about you know progressing through my career and how how the industry was all shaped and I kind of took a step back and focused more on family at that point than my career. And I ended up thinking that if I changed to another airline, that would be better off for my family and personal life. So we ended up changing to a, uh, another regional airline and flew there for about four years. And it wasn't looking like it was a very good move. There. And the airline was kind of in its decline and uh, wasn't doing so well. And that's when I ended up getting the job that I have now. I really didn't want to do it. My personal thoughts were I was going to be flying rich people around that were very picky on what they wanted and how things were supposed to be done. And it was going to be gone for a long period of time. And I thought, nope, I don't want to do that. I had a lot of friends talk me into it. <laughs> and my wife talked me into it, at least interviewing. I got hired pretty much on the spot. The next day they called me. I took the job and I haven't looked back. I've been there for 17 years. So it's been a pretty good job. Yeah. 
Would you say, and I don't know if this is typical of the field, but being a pilot, you move between these different roles, you know, in the private, the commercial, the, the freight, the fractional. Would you say it was, I don't want to make it sound too easy or just take it for granted. You probably have to be good at what you do and get interviewed and know what you're doing. But would you say that if you were pretty adept at what you do, like being able to move between if you were unhappy in the freight, moving over to commercial, if you're unhappy in commercial, moving over to charter or more of the private business, would you say that that's it's fairly easy? So everything that you do as a pilot, you're doing to get that commercial job, that airline job. So being a flight instructor, that was building time to get to that next level so that I could fly free. And the industry is a little bit different now. So I, I don't know if there's a whole lot of guys still flying freight and smaller aircraft, but that was the next progression for me. But it was all um, about getting your commercial. It wasn't because you, you didn't want to do private. So you went to freight. You didn't want to do freight. So you went to commercial, you know. Right. So really yeah, everything so was building up to commercial until the 9-11 changed your mindset of. That's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. So everything, okay. I, my goal was to go work for one of the big three. And that was my goal straight out from the very beginning. So that, that's why I didn't want to go to the fractionals even. I thought, yeah. oh, I'm going to go to American. I'm going to go to Delta or United. So everything that I did along that path was to build more hours, build more experience, and get to that interview for Delta or United or, you know, American. 9-11 kind of shifted all of that. And uh, the <laughs> we in the industry, the airlines are continually cyclical. There's yeah. periods of high employment and periods of low employment, and they're furloughing and laying off. And um, I, I've been kind of riding on the backside of that wave all, all, all through my career, but it, it's it's been a pretty good career so far. Would you say most people, most pilots you know, like have that goal in mind of working for the big the big three or is that like only half the people it's not that common or it's the majority it's funny because um i always thought that's where everybody wanted to go to the airlines that's where the the big airplanes are that's where the most money is and it's the prestige of flying for a you know international company so that's what i wanted when I got into the fractional business, I have met a lot of guys that are like, oh, yeah, I don't want anything to do with the airlines. This is what I want to do. So I, I'd i say a majority of guys still want, you know, to, to fly the big airplanes and fly for the, the international companies. But there, there are quite a few that say, hey, you know what? I, I'm good with small corporate aircraft. Mm -hmm. And that's where that's where I want to be. Yeah. So James, is that where you're at? Do you have thoughts like that of going to the big three or you kind of already know where you want to go with it? Yeah, for me, I think a lot of what he said about the process of getting there, which is getting the CFI certifications and then going up and getting those hours and then, you know, eventually getting to the point where I do get the ATP and I can go to the airlines and, you know, work for one of the big three or really any big airline that you know, flies basically everywhere. And did you know about the fractional airline industry? I've actually never heard of that until today. I heard of charter, heard of a lot of different types of flying and know quite a bit of people that do different types of flying. Never heard of fractional till today. So very interesting. That's great. I mean, that, that's, I like to try to pull things out that, you know, it's like somebody's hasn't heard about some new ideas or a new way of looking at, you know, new perspectives. That is pretty neat, Brian, that we ended up talking to you. Moving on from that, do you have any likes or dislikes about your job? Sounds like you're pretty happy with it. You're, I'd like to hear if there are any dislikes that you would yeah. make sure people knew about <laughs> before they just thought it was all roses. And then so, like your work-life balance. Yeah. The, so the work-life balance is pretty good. I Typically, but for my schedule, I work seven days and then I'm off seven days. So I... <laughs> I, I always have liked to say, you know, by about day five on the road, I'm like, oh, when do I get to go home? And by about day five at home, the family's like, when are you going back to work? <laughs> but um, so, but, but it works. It works very nicely. The things that I don't like, we, we work long hours. A typical day for us, and, and this isn't flight time, it's just hours working, is anywhere from average of about 12 hours to be honest 
which, you know, starts getting kind of long when you're, you've got people's lives in your hands and, you know, you're flying from, you know, say coast to coast or something. So it, it does start getting kind of long. Our minimum time off is 10 hours. That's from the moment that you basically put the uh, airplane to, to bed, so to speak, and uh, shut it down and you're off to the hotel. So you have 10 hours to get your sleep, get something to eat, get showered in the morning, get something to eat in the morning, and off again. So it does get pretty compressed. So that that's probably my biggest dislike is just the long hours and the short overnights. And do you you work overnight sometimes? Um, Would you call sometimes. it like shift work? Or are you on call, so to speak, so, during those seven yeah, days? So um, again, going back to the iPhone, typically it's early morning. So for the airplane that I'm on, it's typically uh, about a six o'clock show in the morning and, you know, typically till about six o'clock in the evening time, somewhere in there. There are occasions though, and, and that time does change depending on what the company wants us to do and depending on what owners they want us flying for. I've done red eyes that start at 8 p.m. in the evening time and fly till six o'clock in the morning. I don't care for those. Yeah, but for me on my aircraft, that is not the norm. We have approximately, oh gosh, probably about eight to 10, I want to say, different types of airplanes within our company. And the, the bigger ones that do a lot of the international flying, you'll see them do a lot more of the uh, red eyes going over to Europe and so forth. Okay. Yeah. So it's not like the whole industry just kind of works for that schedule. You have a range of positions. Typically, or... yeah. Yep. yeah. Okay. Is there any ongoing certifications? Is this like a never-ending learning thing that you have to keep up? Or once you get there, you're kind of good, you know, and you can coast for the next few years? Oh, gosh. So... <laughs> So once you get hired to an airline or the the fractional like I'm with, it's usually about every year you have to go back to school. And that entails about a five to four day going back to school, flying the simulator for typically for, for us, it's three sessions that we fly, ranging everything from emergency procedures to, you know, just regular line flying from point A to point B. And then on the final day, we usually do a what's called a check ride. And that's when the examiner is in the back and he makes sure that you're indeed doing exactly what you need to be doing correctly. Okay. I was going to ask James if he was aware that that's kind of a common, is that a commonly known thing? Yeah. I don't, I don't know if it's commonly known, but I know about it. So, okay. Yeah. The other part of that is, is that every six months, as a uh, a commercial pilot, you have to keep up your your medical, and that just entails going and getting what's called a first class medical. Um, and the ba- the doctor basically checks your hearing, your eyesight, blood pressure, it, just a basic, simple medical. I'm fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's every every six months. And once you're over the age of forty five. You have to start getting uh, EKGs at least once a year. Uh, I think it's over the age of 45. Um, you have to get your first one. And then I, I believe every year after that, you have to uh, get at least one EKG a year. So okay. th- those are pretty much the requirements to maintain your commercial pilot, if you will, your ATP. On the income side, talked about this a little bit earlier too. Is there any feedback you have or how would you tie an income with? whether it's personal or in tiers of the different charter commercial freight, you know, I'm sure it's like anything, the more experience you get, one would assume the better off you are. That may not be the case if you stay in certain industries or certain industries known as being better than others levels. So w- when I started, the income was very low. I remember my first real airline job. I was making eh, somewhere in the, the mid 20s to start out with the first year. Once you start progressing, and, and things have changed drastically since then. I, I believe I just saw the other day for a, a regional airline that is, you know, the subsidiaries of the, the, the big three, if you will. I want to say that they were offering about a hundred grand as a uh, a bonus for the first year. That was unheard of. <laughs> I saw his eyes pop up there. Um, that was unheard of when, when I uh, 
when I James was going to ask for the link to that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but nowadays, things are much different. The airlines themselves, the, the big three, if you've put in you know a, a number of years and you're a captain, you're making well into the six-figure digits. It, it's, a, it's a comfortable living. For, for the company I'm working for, it is a six-figure job. And it's, it's well into it. So it, it is comfortable. It, it allows you, you know, the freedom to have, have a little bit of money. And it's a good paying job, really. So it has a high ceiling and different. You can kind of like in the fractional and the commercial, basically, it's there's high ceilings and multiple pass up. Yeah. So, yeah, once once you have put in your hours, like you kind of said, in your time, you know, you, you keep on making, you know, the, the pay scale keeps on going up. If you're with the same company, uh, and I guess that's kind of an important thing there as well. Say I I leave my company now and go work for, say, one of the big three. I will start down at the bottom of the pay scale and their, their seniority list. So all pilots are on a seniority list with the company that they work for. If you stay with the same company, you start working up the same pay scale and working up the seniority list. That's how you become a captain. And that's how you get paid more. Um, so if you change jobs, you'll start down at the bottom and then start working your way up. You know, in my job, I'm in electrical engineering and it's not uncommon for people to change companies and to get big bumps when they do that. You know, but somebody in your job is thinking maybe they, oh, I'll just go work for one company in five years, move to another one and move up. And, you know, you may get stuck at somewhere and get stuck in a lifestyle making a lot of money but if you decide you don't like that particular airline and you want to just go jump to another one like eh, there's a lot to think about yeah. there yeah 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 you, most guys don't do that if you spend any amount of time at an airline or you know, company in general yeah if you're leaving that place you're probably going to start down at the bottom and then have to work your way up I, I, for myself, I always kind of set 45, to, you know, as my age to where I was like, I'm probably going to stick with this company no matter where I'm at, at, th at that point in my life, because to go back down, it just wasn't worth it financially. And yeah, so your seniority on that pilot list for whatever that company is, is everything. It, it defines your, your pay. It defines your schedule. It defines your vacations. And the more seniority you get, the better life you're going to have. You know, the better schedule, the better money, the better vacations. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's actually very important for somebody early on, finding out, mapping more than a few years of their life out to commit to something. And if you don't sell like something in one or two years, you better move fast because you, you don't want to stay there too long and make them. Yeah. Move. Yeah. I, for, for instance, you know, I, with the airlines that I work for, the first one I worked for five years. The second one I worked for about four years and decided, yeah, the, I'm going to make that next jump. And hopefully that'll be my, my final, you know, career position. So far, it's looking like that's true. <laughs> Do you have any questions about that, James, before we move on? I think I did have one question. So for me, because I want to go to currently I went to school. They have an aviation program. It's one of the best in the United States. I mean, there's always a way to find to put the best in there somehow. But I have a couple of friends that are going, one that's in the aviation program, and it's at Letourneau. So they have their aviation degrees, which is the way that you can get into the aviation program. And the one that I'm interested in is the pro flight degree. And basically, it'll take you through you know, your four years of school. I think the first year, it's just classes. And then the second year on, you start actually flying, and they take you through Everything up to the commercial license, including getting CFI certifications, you know, along the way so that you can get those hours. And I was just interested to hear your thoughts on basically, is there something else that I could throw in there or that I should, you know, consider? So the, <laughs> it, it really depends on where the, the aviation uh, community is at the, at the, the time. Right now, there, there's a pilot shortage. And for me personally, what I would recommend, uh, uh, you know, uh, a young guy just getting into it, uh, do it the fastest that you, the fastest way possible. And uh, it, it's difficult because I was always under the, the assumption that 
and, and at the time that I was getting into, a, into aviation, you needed a degree, some type of bachelor degree or something. Today, uh, that's not so much the case. I think most of the, the big airlines and um, I think even the company I work for, we don't even require degrees anymore. It, it's just a matter of flight time and having your, your commercial license and your ATP and all that. So I, I would almost say, hey, it, it, it's, it's tough to give that advice because it really depends on, on the individual. Hey, do you want to go to the four-year college and get all of your ratings and a degree? Or do you just want to go to a uh, – there's flying schools out there, like uh, one's called All ATPs. That there's numerous ones out there that you can strictly just go to and get your ratings and go start flying. And there's a lot of those schools. And like I said, I'm kind of out of that realm for the most part anymore. But I know a lot of those schools that are private do have connections with airlines, whether it's a, a, a regional feeder or whether it's uh, like a Frontier or a JetBlue or something like that, where they you know automatically get you an interview at one of those airlines and get you started on that that airline career. I, I know a lot of universities kind of have that same setup as well. It really depends on what you want to do and um, fi financially as well. If, if you got, you know, of course, scholarships to a university or something, heck, go that route because going to one of these private flight schools is pretty ex expensive as well. So it, it just depends on where you are in your life, what kind of finances you have as well. So that kind of leads me to a question about the degree programs. You know, I don't, I don't definitely don't want to discourage anybody from getting a degree because it's, you know, I have four kids myself and I, you know, I tell them it's, it just gives you options. It doesn't guarantee you anything. It just gives you maybe, maybe a little better option than if you didn't have it. But in this specifically, what does a degree, you know, in this case, there's networking, there's, you know, you're getting to work alongside getting your hours while you're you know, studying, what else would, a, does a degree get you anywhere faster? You know, does it open up doors that maybe wouldn't be open without a degree when it comes to being a pilot? You know, are there any big drawbacks that you see? You know, I can think in other industries where there's definitely drawbacks or you get very fixed in a certain paths and you can't get into other lanes, you know, but for being a pilot, I don't know if you can speak to that or not. Right. It, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of under the same assumptions. Um, I, I, I personally don't see a degree as being bad. And if you have that degree, I am sure, uh, in fact, I know that that's just one more check mark on that application and resume that you, you know, you have a degree and it, it kind of lifts you up a little higher, if you will. The drawbacks to not having one, eh, it's probably negotiable. I guess if you wanted to leave the industry, um, you know, like you, you, okay, now I don't have a degree. I'm 45 years old. I decided to get out of the industry. But then if your degree was in flying, right? you know, like maybe picking a versatile degree that plays well among a range of things, thinking of it that way, or I guess looking at job roles, if you were to go work for different entities, probably right. maybe an air, airline or pilot associated type flying degree, avionics, I guess would be a better word. You know, right. degree would probably help in job roles outside of being a pilot specifically, but you wanted to stay in the aviation industry. So, I see yeah. where that would be so helpful. I know a lot of guys that have gotten that aviation degree in some realm of the aviation industry and they go into either management, which is a popular, you know, step off to the side of a pilot and then into the, the management side of an aviation company. For me, like I said earlier, I, I always thought, well, what if I lose my first class medical? What if my airline, you know, collapses and is no longer an airline? What am I going to do? And that's why I got the communications degree. So it was at least something completely out of the industry that I could fall back on and say, Hey, I've got this degree in communications. You know, I, I can explore other avenues other than an aviation career. Yeah, that was a great topic to talk about. And kind of to wind that topic down about, about education, 
Uh, James, you've touched on Letourneau uh, research in this. A friend mentioned the uh, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Um, Brian, do you have any other, I guess, you know, a few names to throw out there if somebody was looking at show notes on this and kind of wondering, like, I'll go Google it and I'm going to get whoever paid to have their ad put up front. But do you have any recommendations for either the flight schools or education programs? Yeah, if you're looking for uh, universities, the, the big ones are Embry-Riddle. That's, that's the biggest well-known one out there. There's also um, Purdue University, which has a great flying program. North Dakota University, I believe, also has a, another great program. Th- those are about the big three that come out. And then there's some that are, are kind of like right below that level. And I can't come up with names. Th- those are the, the big ones that for university-wise. As far if you didn't want to follow the university path, oh gosh, there, there's a number of them. I went to one that's based down in Florida now. That's called Ari Ben Aviator. I believe that's in Fort Pierce. They were great. There's another one called All ATPs. And there's just a number of different types of flight schools like that where they take you from zero time all the way up to an interview with an airline. You know, if somebody was looking for jobs in this industry, what are, you know, some terms other than just randomly searching pilot? I mean, is that, is it that generic or are there specialized <laughs> names that are helpful to know? You know what? what one site that I have always loved, it's called, um, I believe it's Airline Pilot Central, and they give you a breakdown of every single airline out there, how many airplanes they have, how many pilots they have, whether or not they're hiring and how much you can possibly make at that airline. It is a fantastic resource. And wow. if you're looking into getting into the industry, I, I would highly recommend just kind of looking through that website. I believe there's a, a forum on there as well where you know individuals can talk back and forth about what's going on, who's interviewing for what, and what the interview process is kind of like. And do people normally go to airline industries to look for jobs? Do you have to know the name of the company or do they, you go on Indeed or Monster.com and uh, type in? I that want, one I couldn't tell you anymore. Um, no. I, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that I'm not sure. I know at the time when I was starting to look, it was a centralized kind of website that you went to, but I, I couldn't even tell you what it is anymore. So I, I, that I'm not sure. James, have you gotten into any of that? Like just poked around at like what kind of job openings? I know you're early and you're not going to be a commercial pilot tomorrow. But, you know, have you thought yeah. about jobs or where you would go look or have you even done that? Yeah, I have. I've looked at through, through this certain stuff like, you know, going through regionals, uh, regional airlines first and then going up and joining the bigger mother company, if you want to call it that, the mother airline, you know, like American Eagle and then American Airlines, right, for example. And I've seen that stuff. I didn't know about what you just talked about. I'll definitely have to look into that that resource. But yeah, looking at like different how they hire and what companies do hire more pilots and, you know, of course, pay. So you're looking more, though, not on like a generic like LinkedIn or Monster.com. You're having to know to go look at the mother airlines, the regional airline names is where you're looking more for the job. The yeah, job I look at. You know, not just one or two websites, but two dozen websites, three dozen websites, you know, get all the different information that I can out of it. The ones that I would yeah, recommend it would be the one I said earlier. I believe it's called Airline Pilot Central. And then the other one is Flight Level 350. And those are probably two of the best resources out there to just get information about who's doing what in the industry. That's the job search, salaries, well-established programs. We talked a lot already about the different uh, roles. If you could, maybe just real quick, you don't have to get into too long a description of them, but just the different tiers as you started. I think you mentioned uh, private, then instrumental, then commercial. And what are your different, those are your license that you have. And then what are your different titles? First officer, captain, training captain. What's that ladder, career ladder? Yeah, the, the career ladder, basically, when you get hired at an airline, we we'll use that term generically there. When you get hired at an airline, you become a first officer there. You're sitting in the, the right seat and basically you're assisting the captain. 
in all the duties of flying the aircraft, making sure number one, safety is always number one. And then, you know, making sure that passengers get from, of course, point A to point B. Once you start moving up the seniority list and you have enough seniority and that depends on the company, it depends on yeah, a lot of different things. But like I mentioned earlier, the seniority list is what where your progression is within the company. And um, once you start moving up that list, you will become a captain. That's pretty much uh, you know, the, the pinnacle of the uh, flying career is to be a captain at an airline. For me, I wanted to instruct new guys coming in. So I applied to become an instructor pilot. And uh, I've been in that role here for about a year or so now. And you do get paid a little more on that. But my thing was, is that, you know what? I, I was one of these young guys that came in and... Um, you know, I had a lot of good instructor pilots and I was hoping to, you know, be one of those guys myself and pass along good information, practical information, and, um, you know, just be able to help out and mentor the new guys coming up in, in the industry. Yeah. So those guys are going to be flying your family. One yeah, day, so. that, that's exactly it. <laughs> that's exactly it. You have a vested interest. Yes. <laughs> no, that's great to hear that. That's your outlook on it. That is nice to hear. And I, I like to see. I like to call it at some point in my career, I'd like to get paid for what I know, not what I do. Right. Yep, exactly. <laughs> so, no, there's a crossover point you make it, hopefully at some point. That's exactly it. Depending on what your industry is. But the last thing I have really is just any ad advice or inspiring words. And James, I want to give you a chance at the end for any questions too. Um, so maybe I'll ask James if you have any questions and then we'll wrap up, you know, Brian, with any advice you might have to the next round of pilots or you know, inspiring words you have that you'd like to share before we drop off. But James, do you have any, uh, any further questions or anything like that? No, I think I'm good. Thank you. All right. Great. So Brian, uh, any yeah. parting words? In like parting words. Uh, now, you know what? It, it's something that you have to have passion for. And if you, if you don't have that passion, you just think, Oh, I want to be a pilot because it pays well. I wouldn't recommend it. You, you definitely have the passion because it is a lot of steps. It's a lot of testing and um, it is a lot of hard work, but it's very rewarding once you get there. And uh, yeah, it, it's a great career. You get to see the world if you want to. It, it provides well for, you know, bringing up a family and all that kind of stuff as well. If I may, one of those things that I we hadn't talked about and, you know, perks of a job that I was just kind of thinking about myself sitting here there's a lot of perks to be at a pilot as well, whether it's with an airline where you get to fly for free um, anywhere you want in the, the world, really. And that's probably the biggest perk that uh, people probably would think of. Just hop on. Do you there. get to bring along a significant other? You get to bring along your family. So, yeah. Your, oh, your family. Yeah. yeah. So the entire family gets to fly for free. And typically with the airlines, your mom and dad also get to fly for free or at least a, a very steep discount as well and with that do your parents know that james <laughs> <laughs> as well um you get what's called buddy passes at the airlines so you can hand those out to friends uh usually it's about five a year somewhere in there depending on the airline and uh those people get to fly at a steeply discounted rate as well so that's that's the big thing for for me in the fractional industry we fly on corporate jets that are um, occupied most of the time by very wealthy individuals. And um, when it's not occupied, we get we can fly on the back of those the, our aircraft for free as well. Now, it's kind of a surprise where where, where you're going to go because you, you can't just say, "Oh, I want to go to this place." It's you know if there is a airplane going to wherever you you know it's going you can hop on that airplane and go. But it is a pretty nice benefit. We also get hotel points, which allow you to stay at hotels for free. And then we also get, so when we fly to go find our airplanes, wherever they are in the country, we usually fly on the back of the airlines and we get the airline points. So therefore we can kind of fly for free on the airlines as well. So those are just... Wow some of the, the the perks and benefits there's a few others here and there but those are the big ones really 
If you like to travel and see places, that's huge because that's usually the biggest, uh, A, you need time off to go and B, you need money to go. Right. But if you're racking up hotels, you're getting free airlines, your job is basically going to a destination anyway. Right. That is your office, is the way to the destination. And I, I, I tell people, I, I haven't paid for a hotel room in probably the last 10 years. It's, it's all been on points. So it, it's amazing. a huge perk to the business. Yeah. So thanks for sharing that yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody's looking to maybe wonder if they should cross over that threshold and make that decision. Maybe that's <laughs> maybe that's what they needed to hear. Yeah, yeah. Well, great. We'll wrap it up with that. I really appreciate both of your time and sharing your insight and James sharing your curiosity about this. And hope there were some good takeaways from everybody on it. And we'll see where this goes. Absolutely. If you like what you hear and want to take the next steps in exploring your career after listening to an episode, go to jobguppy.com to see a summary and helpful links to things mentioned during the interview, like industry-specific forums or websites, example job searches, career ladders, and degree programs or trade school recommendations. The hope is you now have more information than you did before from the guest on the podcast to help you move forward with the next steps on your career exploration journey. Tune in each week as Job Guppy continues to explore a million jobs in the sea.